Question. When was the last time a song really worked for you within a film scene? And I don't mean that as a kind of rhetorical, this sort of thing doesn't happen a lot in the cinema question. It absolutely does. I recently just watched a film that had two Phoebe Bridges songs in it, and that did a whole lot of emotional heavy lifting for me. But what I do mean to say is that music is an invaluable tool for filmmakers. The right song, in the right scene, at the exact right moment, is exactly why I can show you this frame, or this frame, and you're probably already hearing specific songs. But I just rewatched Vin Vendor's stunning Perfect Days from last year, and I was struck again by just how expertly music is used throughout. How Vendor's weaves in the perfect needle drops. But what exactly is a needle drop? And is there a right way to use them in film? Well, at this point, I think we've established, I hope, that you've heard music in film. That's it, that's all a needle drop is. It's just an existing song being used within a film or TV show scene. So why use a needle drop at all? Well, brace yourselves for an incredibly obvious answer to that question. Music just sounds good, right? Sound is one of the key ways to build any emotional atmosphere within a scene. If you want to build elation, mystery, sadness, you name it, there's nothing like a good song to immediately evoke an emotional reaction in an audience on an almost subconscious level. You always assume that you put a song, you like it, and it occurs in the course of the day, out of a sudden you hear that song, it really strikes you and it's exactly what you needed at that moment. If you then listen to the lyrics, I tell you, 10 out of 10 times you realize the lyrics hit it and you didn't listen to them. They weren't conscious. But needle drops are being exploited a lot. Uh, maybe exploited is too heavy a word there, but there's definitely a wrong way to do them, I think. We've all seen films that feel like they over rely on music to set a tone in a scene, or that feel like music is just this cool stylistic choice that they can use. For me, one of the biggest things you can get wrong as a filmmaker is overly holding your audience's hand. Right, And a song can be a great way into a moment, into a scene, but it can also just feel way too obvious. I think audiences don't want to be told how to feel broadly. They just want to feel. So what is it that Perfect Days is doing so right here? Well, I think it's hitting two fundamentals when it comes down to music in film. Firstly, it's that subconscious emotion of music, right? The way it literally makes us feel in the moment. And secondly, it's the relationship between music and the things we're seeing happen in the film. Because Vendors is so acutely aware of these things as a filmmaker, and it's bled through every single one of his films up until this point. But with Perfect Days, it feels particularly pointed and poignant as a result. Because at its core, the film is primarily to me about attachment and detachment. It's about a man who was left behind an undisclosed past to live a simpler life cleaning toilets, detached from his past, but whose routine is interrupted by reminders of his attachment to the world. In one scene, he speaks beautifully about the different worlds that him and his sister inhabit, the different worlds of everyone in life, really. And Vendor's film explores that primarily, the kind of threads between those worlds. And musically, I love the way that Vendor's and his co-writer Takumi Takasaki use Hirayama's infatuation with 70s cassettes to pull us into the world of the film. Every single needle drop within Perfect Days is a diegetic use of music. It's happening within the world of the film. We are literally watching Hirayama listen to these songs as they happen. And a majority of that music in the film happens as he drives through Tokyo in his van, either alone or with his co-worker and eventually with his niece. Each of these moments of listening where we hear Hirayama's choice of cassette allows us access, however momentarily, to his headspace. We see Hirayama choosing his cassettes. He's just not just grabbing and putting it in there. He's looking, he's choosing. So each time we, we realized he's, this is the program of the day for him and he's sort of DJing his day there. Our introduction to Hirayama's music choice comes in the form of the animal's House of the Rising Sun, which to me creates this almost immediately regretful atmosphere. There's this sense of longing, I think, that comes through as soon as you hear Eric Burden's voice on that track. It's a great way into the life of our main character here, injecting into his morning routine, hearing the music and seeing Hirayama in his van with shots of the outside world framed through his windshield. It almost builds this kind of secluded bubble around him for me. There's this melancholic but also weirdly rebellious vibe to him in these moments and that starts to pull out this divide between his own secluded routine and world and the world of the city that's moving on around him. But it's so telling that most of the moments in an otherwise sonically very quiet film happen inside that van. Listening to cassettes, this small space moving through an otherwise bigger city. But it's also just such a human thing listening to music in a car, right? 
if you're a driver or a passenger. I think about growing up and all the times I was sat in a passenger seat with my head on the window, listening to whatever song was coming on the radio, thinking I was the main character in a movie. We've all been there and I refuse to believe that any of you haven't. But I love the idea of this vehicle in the film being a space to reflect on the music. And for Hirayama, it's so clearly tied to routine, which means that the choice of song in the film takes on a much bigger meaning. Oh shit. There's a moment in the film where Hirayama listens to Otis Redding on his morning commute. Sitting in the morning sun I'll be sitting when the evening comes Again, this moment of reflection for Hirayama, in his van, in this established routine, it asks us to sit with the music and really contemplate it alongside him. And sitting at the dock of the bay, for me, has this kind of tonal duality, I guess. On the one hand, it's quite a relaxed vibe of a song, but on the other, it has this real loneliness to it, as Redding sings about ships rolling in and out. And side note, I just love these shots, the way that Vendors ties together this feeling of pause that bleeds through from sitting on the dock of the bay, together with visuals of traffic in the city. Masterstroke. But this kind of double-edged tone to the music, it becomes this kind of thread that links all of the needle drops in the film, right up until the final one, which is Nina Simone's Feeling Good, which is a moment in which we quite literally just sit and watch Hirayama reflect on the music in real time. His emotions fluttering between sadness, happiness, contentedness, regret, really anything that you want to bring to it as a viewer, I think you can read through the stunning performance here. When I first saw Perfect Days, I loved it, and I was immediately very drawn to the music in it, but I don't think it's until you've gone through the entire narrative with Hirayama, learnt about his life, his niece, his sister, his father's deteriorating condition, that you begin to actually appreciate what the music means to him in the film. And I think there's this real sadness and melancholy that starts to imbue all of those needle drop moments in the film once you understand that. It's all pulled together crucially by Koji Yakusho's stunning central performance, but Vendors, by allowing us to sit with our central character as he listens and reflects with music, is able to bring this real genuine authenticity to all of the needle drop moments. And that is why I feel like every single piece of music in the film feels so valuable to it. I think for Hirayama as well, the music he listens to is so clear tied to a specific time and even if Vendors never explicitly tells us much about his past in the film the fact that all of this music is from the 60s and a very identifiable decade in music I think creates this very natural feeling of nostalgia through its sound and watching Hirayama react to it but also the fact that we see him choose these cassettes in the film adds a layer of agency to it all that suggests to me this real longing for something that he had before. It's such a smart and intuitive way of communicating a character's changed world and his relationship with his past self. And that shows a filmmaker to me that is so in touch with the act of listening to music, right? Because there really is nothing like music in the way that it's so able to communicate very universal emotions and themes and motives without saying things too explicitly. And it's a film that by design puts the act of listening directly into its cinematic language. We watch characters interact with the music that we're watching them listen to as well as listening to ourselves. So I think in that sense Perfect Days kind of doesn't work at all without the music. If you took all of the music out of this film you'd be stripping away an integral part of its voice and its language. So the next time you're watching a film and your favourite song comes on screen think about what it's doing to the moment, to the characters in front of you. Is it telling you anything about them? Is it evoking emotions that you otherwise might not have been able to capture in that moment? And does it feel honest and valuable to the film and the scene because if the filmmaker is not giving you any clear answers to any of those questions then the chances are they've just wasted a perfectly good needle drop and in a world of filmmakers like Vin Vendors behind cameras that truly is a crime. 